Hey there, Dave Life's KM Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video page. And we're back in the silo again. Wind's blowing at about 40 outside. And get too many complaints when uh, it's windy, so we'll stay here. And it's pretty peaceful right now. Uh, I've had a lot of uh, notes and emails in the last month or two about people who said that they've tried to broach this topic with individuals and they get rebuffed and people don't want to hear about it, they don't want to talk about it, or they believe it's uh, just gobbledygook and they don't even want to give it two cents of their time. In this world, there's two kinds of people. There's people that have an inquisitive mind and people who don't care. There's people that are critical thinkers, and there's some people who can't think outside of what they see on TV. It's just the facts of life. Uh, I am going to continue to try to notch away at that 1% out there. I know I'm not going to be able to get the vast majority of people to pay attention. But if I can get one or two every week, I'm making progress. And that's what we're going to do. And this video today is to help you, our villagers, to get more people to come over. And how you can do that using the research we've done. And you're going to see that real quick. The other day, I was having a discussion with a really good friend. And we were, about, we were talking about the code that we live under. And... What I mean by that is what, what's your mantra? What, what type of words have meaning in your life? And if you were to die today, they would say, what five words about you would describe you as a person? Um, they treated everyone with dignity and respect. Um, they were honest and good people. They were hard working their whole life. So what's your code? And I think that really says a lot about the people that are here right now and the people that make comments on these videos. I think this is an important part of life too. And to be one of our villagers, one of our main codes on the comments to the video site, is you treat people with dignity and respect. It's great to disagree, but you don't have to call them names and you don't have to berate them and demean them. Be respectful. And honestly, I think that a lot of people appreciate that respect and they'll listen if you're respectful, which is really what all we can ask. Now, so, the code I try to live by, honesty, respect, integrity, empathy, understanding. Uh, I think those are big, really big. And sometimes when you're younger, some younger people have a difficult time with this. So I remember when I was in my early 20s, I was a policeman. And I heard a lot of people say, you know, respect isn't gained by wearing a uniform, having a rank. Something called respect is earned by day-to-day -day living and the way you treat people every day you walk out in that public. And you're judged at the end of your life by that behavior over long-term life issues. What what have you been faced with and how have, how have you handled it as a person? Can you imagine if you're at the end of life and during your whole life, you had a video camera on your shoulder and in 30 minutes, you, you saw a reel of your life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. What would that reel look like? Did you do more good than harm? Did you demean more people or did you help more people? If your mom was sitting there with you, would your mom be proud of that reel? 
I don't know. It's a good question. And that code. So I, I hope that the code here amongst everybody is as I described. Empathy, compassion, truthfulness, honesty, critical thinker, open mind. Now, there's a fine line sometimes between having an open mind and being gullible. Now, let me stop here. One of the complaints I have is people say, Dave, don't talk so much at the beginning of the video. We don't like hearing it. Just get straight to the stories. That's all we're here for. <laughs> but you see, I'm trying to lay the patchwork for a really sustainable program here. I'm not here for your view today or to entertain you today. I really think that we have the possibility of getting something for the long term that could be meaningful, that we can go to and support each other. Now, like I've told you before, um, I was raised in the Latter-day Saint Church as a Mormon. And truthfulness, I can never remember anybody in that church that I didn't like. They were all, as, as that code said, empathy, compassion, truthful, polite. That was just my experience. And they took care of each other in a huge way. If somebody lost their job, they came with food. If you needed lodging, they found a lodge. They found a room for you. It's just the way they are. And it's the way the church was set up. I'm not, a mem I'm not a member of the church now, but I'm just telling you my experience. And that, that village that they had at the church is really the type of village we need to establish here. And the more people we can get on board, the better and the more strength we'll have moving forward. And why do you need that? Well, talk about missing people here. We talk about mental health issues. Well, I'm going to get into something about why we need each other. So before we get there, I told you that I'm, I've got to find an alternate site for this program. I've got it. And a lot of you put Rumble. Now, one of the biggest things, sorry about that. One of the biggest things before you make a recommendation to me and have me spend the time to look at it, do your own research. So one of the things in the site I'm gonna to go to, wherever that is, I can guarantee one thing, that site will not own my content. Rumble owns your content. You upload onto Rumble, they own it. And a lot of the sites coming out that have videos from people, that's the way they make their money. They sell your content on to others who want to pirate it or use it or something. There's no way I'm doing that. YouTube has a check mark on our page, on our analytical page, that says that they can allow people to use your content in 60 second intervals. I never check that. No, you're not, you can't use it. Um, so please, before you make any recommendations, check it out yourself. So it has to be able to be monetized. And I have to get a way back to make, make my money back that I'm doing this with. Uh, so those are two big things. I own the content forever. It can be monetized. And there's no restrictions on freedom of speech. None. Now, obviously you can't scream fire in a crowded uh, theater. I get that, but just follow our, our freedom of speech laws and rights that we have. That's all I ask, and I'll look into it. Thanks. So, <laughs> so one time I'm going to go through this list, so pay attention. Complaints I have had uh, about this show in the last six months again if i took all of the complaints to heart that i get 
I'd probably be in a mental health facility locked up. I can't take them seriously. Because everybody likes to complain. <laughs> they complain about stuff you guys would never know. But here's a few. They complain that I talk about mental health. I've got, I've got like five of those in the last five days. Please stop talking about mental health. Uh, no, not gonna happen. Now you may live on an island of ignorance and think that your life is blissful. But part of life is understanding how your neighbor lives. Part of life is being compassionate and understanding. And part of life is helping others. Whether you go down to the soup kitchen and you feed meals to the poor and underprivileged, which will maybe give you a little bit of insight as to how the other side does live. And maybe you could be there next week with, without the good grace of your spiritual advisor. I can remember the first time Angie and I went down in, uh, in Denver and served food to the soup kitchen. Wow. People lead a, lead a rough life. It was humbling. Then Ben and Angie and I went down there one time and I know Ben was stunned. But you know what? More people need to do that. We spent a whole day there preparing the food and then we served it. You don't need to be employed, unemployed to do that. You can do it on weekends. You can do it on holidays. Volunteering and giving of yourself is a huge part of life. Remember, compassion, empathy. Contributing to the village good. People have said, Dave, I don't want to hear about the world situation. I don't, don't talk about that. I'm here just for missing people. Stop talking about it. <laughs> okay. Remember what I told you about some people want to keep their head in the ground. They don't want to hear about it. I understand that. And there's kind of the same way, and I'll give this to sports. When I watch sports on TV, I don't want to hear about a political agenda. I want to hear about nothing but the game they're playing. I want to hear about the angles that the coaches are having. I want to hear about the, the aches and pains of the players, but I don't want to hear about your politics. Sorry, just don't, not interested. Um, sometimes I think the players forget that. They're there to play a game. So about me not talking about world issues, I'm not gonna talk about it here. I'm not saying I'm never gonna talk about it again, but I never have received more hate mail in my life than when I started to talk about these things. And the reason I was talking about it to begin with is I think our world is changing to a point that we may never see our old world again. Yeah, I do. I wouldn't have said that six months ago, but some people I am very close to who are much smarter than me have said this to me. And it's a scary proposition. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Another complaint. Dave, stop reading those letters. They're useless. They're not interesting. <laughs> okay. I thought some of the best things in the videos I've made have been some of those letters that you guys have written. Fascinating stuff. Uh, makes, me, makes me think. Now, I only read probably one out of every 300 letters I get, 400 letters, maybe, that I can read in between the videos. But, yeah, you guys have done a phenomenal job. And keep it up. Keep going. I like them. And I'm not just talking about the stories and things that have happened to you, but it's, it's the strategy, it's the angle that some people have taken on the missing person issue. Hey, I'm the first to admit, 
people I work with and me, we don't know everything. And we may miss something. And if you have something to offer that we don't understand, speak up. So, no, I'm not going to stop reading letters. Uh, Dave, don't present historical cases. They're boring. They're old. We don't want that. Really, what they want. I want to be entertained by new relevant cases. Oh, okay. Again, probably not coming from the best critical thinkers. Because there's a thing I learned in, when I was going to college is you study history for a reason. You don't want to replicate those mistakes. And you want to understand what happened and what transpired to have history happen in the manner that it did. So as far back as we can go in history to find cases that are relevant to the missing 411 issue, we're going to do it. And unfortunately for those people who complain about this, you're going to get more of those historical cases as time goes on. And why you ask? Because I think some of those historical cases are more accurate in their reporting than many of the cases you hear about today. Again, the reporters that send us the news today, they aren't really reporters or investigative journalists because they aren't reporting the facts many of the times. And I've probably heard when I get down and I get reports from different agencies about missing people and I compare it to what's written, I'd say half the time it's wrong. That's a lot. <laughs> Last one. Dave, don't wear tank tops anymore. It's not professional. <laughs> tank top. <laughs> and I'm not to throw it in your face, but if it's 95 degrees outside, Dave's going to be comfortable. And if you've watched my 140 videos, you know that what I'm wearing doesn't affect the way I approach a topic or talk to you. I'm going to be professional either way. So those are the big complaints. Two issues that are brought up a lot on the channel that people ask about is, Dave, what about those staircases in the woods? Folks, if staircases in the woods existed, then people would have their GPS coordinates on every site in the world and we could all go out and see them. That was a story that was written several years ago by a fiction writer and posted on Reddit just to see how the story would go. Everybody bought into it. Reddit is a site that's known for fiction writers to write fictional stories to see how well they can get people to glom onto it to decide whether they're going to print it. Be a critical thinker. Don't believe it. Another one that I hear a lot about, oh, Dave, what about DUMBS, D-U-M-B-S? I see these uh, maps uh, with DUMBS all over the U.S. and maps and lines and things, and it, it kind of aligns with your missing person map. Uh, folks, critical thinker, find me one factual, one factual thing that shows that these DUMBS exist. Just one. Not the cool maps. Something factual. Oh, you can't do that. I know because we've looked. So just because something looks real cool and is marketed real neat, don't buy into everything. Be a critical thinker. Mental illness. Now why are we talking about this? I'm going to walk you down a path about why we are. But I want you to just be patient for a second and understand something. You're real good today. You could fall off a cliff mentally tomorrow. And you think, oh, it'll never happen to me. Okay, I get that. I totally get that. You know why? Because when, when you apply to be a policeman in some some towns in a rural county in a small state they're probably going to interview you you might take a physical and then you're going to get the job 
In a place like San Jose, and in Fremont where I worked, first thing they do is they interview you. You take a written test. Well, first it's a written test. Then you take a physical where you gotta run a mile and a half in so much time. Then you take an oral interview. If you pass all that and you get high enough on the list, then you take a psychological screening test and then you sit down with a psychologist. And he ranks you according to how well you do in the psychological test and then asks you specific questions that might arise from what you answered. First took one in Fremont, then I went to San Jose three years later and I took the same sort of tests and I saw the same psychologist. And he goes, you know, it's kind of strange when we get two different tests from the same person. Not everyone switches police departments, but he goes, Dave, your, your results were almost identical. Oh, thanks. And then about seven years later, when I was going on the SWAT team, to be on the SWAT team, you have to take another psychological test and you have to go through the same interview process again. And part of that is because there's a very high likelihood that you could take somebody's life on that team because we're the ones that did the entries on all narcotics warrants, search warrants. We went after, we went after high profile murderers, robbers, rapists, etc. So the third time I went through it with the same psychologist, he said, Dave, he goes, this is phenomenal. I haven't, I've never done three people in you know, this amount of time. He goes, but wow, I gave you an A on your grade the first time and an A the second time, and I should probably give you an A plus this time. All of your tests were almost identical. You don't show any of the uh, hardened characteristics that other policemen do who are in the job. He goes, you have, a, you have a good way of coping with it in your mind. I go, oh, thanks. And he goes, by the way, I am gonna allow you to go on the SWAT team and I'm gonna give you a rave review, so thanks. I go, man, thank you, Doc, I appreciate that. So psychological tests and how you handle things internally are huge. Now, how you handle the death of a friend versus a death of a spouse versus a death of a sibling, entirely different. I can tell you because I've gone through this. Death of my mom. That, that hit me hard. Within six months, my mom, my grandmother, and my best friend all died. Uh, my best friend was killed in a shootout in San Jose. My grandmother died of cancer. My mom died of cancer, all within six months. It was a brutal time in my life. Now, the death of Ben was the most brutal of all. And you think that you can handle everything in the world? Trust me your life can fall off that cliff real quick. And I'm smart enough to realize what I don't know. A lot of people aren't this way. They think they know it all. They think they can handle it all. I've known a lot of men specifically. I'm not going to counseling. I don't need counseling. <laughs> I needed counseling after Ben's death and I'm still going. It's helped me, not a lot, but it's helped me enough to get by. And I just, this segment is important because nobody is beyond getting to that cliff. All right, Yahoo Finance, July 27th, 2021. 47 million Americans are experiencing mental illness right now. Okay. There are 333 million people in the United States up until January 1st. Probably 334 million in the US now. But 47 million Americans experiencing mental illness. 57% of the 47 million are not getting treatment. 60% of the U US counties do not have a psychiatrist. 24% of adults with mental illness who are willing to seek treatment couldn't find it. Wow. When I told you before that uh, when Ben and I and his mom went down in LA trying to get an appointment with a psychiatrist, we had to wait two months. In extreme cases, you can't wait two months. You gotta go right now. And that's when people are, into, are being placed on a forced hold by police. 
California, it's called the 5150 of the Welfare and Institutions Act hold. You're a danger to yourself or you're a danger to others and you're placed on a hold. And you can't get out until a psychiatrist releases you. They can hold you up to a maximum of three days. After three days, you gotta get a court order to hold you. It's not unheard of, but it's rare that they hold you more than three days. Now, I told you before that psychiatrists are hard to find these days and they're so busy. Now, an article July 8th of this year on, in the Huffington Post, five health conditions that are the most underdiagnosed. Number one is depression. Most of the time these conditions are diagnosed or not diagnosed by your own physician because that's who we go to and, they, and in some rural areas they can give you psychiatric medication rather than referring you to somebody. Number two, most underdiagnosed, bipolar and it's misdiagnosed as depression. Number three, PTSD, trauma in the military, in your job, you know, are you normally abused? Who knows? Number four, eating disorders, oftentimes in young girls. This is more common than a lot of people are willing to understand. There's a lot of pressure on young girls in high school to look a specific way, to act a specific way, and they'll go to extremes sometime to get there so they don't have to be bullied or they don't have to not fit in with the crowd they want to be with. It's unfortunate but that's the way some people are. And number five, borderline personality disorder. I can't tell you how important it is as a friend, as a parent, as a loved one, that we pay attention to these signals that are coming out, especially right now in COVID because the rate of medical illness is rising rapidly. And failure to see it can result in something tragic. The vast, vast majority of people who take their lives, the people around them would say, God, I never even saw it coming. Obviously, you have to say that because if you did see it coming, then you will well, I got fooled that you didn't do something. All right, this is an article, NBC4 in Washington, D.C., July 15th, 2021. A 56-year-old man missing for weeks, missing for weeks after walking away from a community-based home for mental health patients was found sleeping on the streets of D.C. His family said it was two weeks before they were told he had left the home. What? His family said it was two weeks before they were told. His family was not contacted, but a supervisor at the home told him that the police report had been filed. Quoting, treatment providers assuming that they can't communicate with families is a very big problem, said Ron Hornberg, retired director of legal affairs for NAMI. Hornberg, an expert in mental health law, says sometimes homes misrepresent or misinterpret, rather, HIPAA. Often the assumption is contacting families in these situations violates patients' rights. But Hornberg says that's not HIPAA's intention. Those are the times when people are most vulnerable and those are the times people need compassionate assistance the most. So, missing person, person walks away from a home, they call the police, but they don't tell the family. Oh my God. <laughs> Let me tell you the facts about this. You call the police, Maybe the officer responding is going to drive around a few blocks looking. Nobody else is going to look. Remember that program, Defund the Police, in urban areas, which is where most of these homes are at? Police don't have the time to look. There's not enough police on the street. They're going call to call to call. Nobody's looking, except the family if you call them. Now, if they didn't call the family for two weeks, what prompted them to call the family at all? Why didn't they just call them that night? If they thought it was a HIPAA violation the first night, well, then it's a HIPAA violation two weeks later. They should have called them because Hornberger's right. 
The intent of HIPAA is not that. So a missing person issue, it's a tragedy. Okay, the best websites for mental health. Get a pen or pencil and we're gonna talk about this. This is a recommendation from Healthline. And for different issues, this is the best online assistance. The best for frequent engagement is the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. The best for 24 seven support is called seven, like the number seven, CUPS. The best for virtual meetings in your neighborhood, NAMI. And remember I told you before, you could join a NAMI meeting anywhere in the world by Skype. And trust me, it's really good. Best for specialized support groups, the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance. I'll get that again. Best for specialized support groups, the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance. Best for co, co uh, best for co-occurring mental health concerns, Mental Health of America. Best for postpartum depression, postpartum support international. Now, I told you we were gonna come full circle and we're gonna talk about why mental health is on my radar besides the fact of men, it's the national parks. Remember, it's a big part of my work. I'm gonna read you something here directly related to national parks and mental health. In 2007, uh, this is from uh, the CDC, our government website, December 3rd, 2010. The title of it is Suicides in National Parks. Whoa. In 2007, the year for which the most recent national data on fatalities are available, 34,598 suicides occurred in the U.S. at a rate of 11.3 per 100,000. Actually, it's 13.8 at the latest two and a half years ago before COVID. 79% were among males. In 2009, an estimated 374,000 visits to hospital emergency departments occurred because of self-inflicted injury. 374,000. Folks, that's a lot of people that tried to harm themselves because of depression, self-inflicted. 374,000. Of which approximately 262,000 could be attributed to suicidal behavior. The majority, 58%, were among females. Most suicides, 77%, occur in the home, but many occur in public places, including national parks. In addition to the loss of life, suicides consume park resources and staff time and can tra traumatize witnesses. To describe the characteristics of, and trends of suicide in national parks, CDC and National Park Service analyzed reports of suicide events occurring in national parks from 2003 to 2009, a seven-year span. 84 national parks reported 286 events, an average of 41 per year. Of the 286 events, 68% were fatal. Two most commonly used methods, firearms and falls. Shoot yourself fall, jump like you're jumping off a bridge. 83% of the suicides were males. National Park System comprised at the time 393 parks, including historic sites, monuments, preserves, lake shores, seashores, reserves, rivers, river, riverways, scenic trails, military parks, battlefields, memorials, rec areas, and parkways in 49 states in every state but Delaware. For this report, deaths during 2003 and 9 that occurred in national parks were identified as suicides if a ranger and or law enforcement personnel determined that the deceased person took his or her own life. For 10 of the 194 deaths coded as suicide, a cause of death was not determined. That's pretty bizarre. They, they can't determine the cause of death, but they attributed it to suicide. 
but sufficient evidence was found to believe a suicide had occurred. During 2003 and 9, 286 suicide events were reported from 84 parks, okay? Six, 7% of the 84 parks had 10 or more events, suicide or attempted suicide. Blue Ridge Parkway and Grand Canyon National Park had the most events, 21 each for those seven years. Approximately 19% of the events involved jumping off a bridge or a cliff. 6% were transportation related. Among 194, 83% were, were males. In 2007, 79% of all suicides were among males. The mean age for a person who committed or attempted suicide in the park was 43 years. Now, why am I telling you that? Because when I'm doing the analysis about a case and I'm reading about it, these things have to come into my mind. Somebody who disappears in a park, one of the first things I do think about is their mental health. And by reading the reports, talking to people, again, many times it's not going to say suicide in a newspaper. If you notice, newspapers almost never talk about suicide. And they want to keep that off the front page for whatever reason. Now, what I told you about at the beginning, how can you use what we've done in our research to help overcome people who are ambivalent or uninterested? Okay. First of all, we've done 140 videos. Let me go through a few of those videos for you. How many people of here have seen the David Place Wikipedia page? Yeah. Well, they said that there's nothing unusual in our research and everything's normal. Well, I'm going to go through a few cases that I want you to remember that we've talked about. Sean Higgins, just a video a week ago, 41 years old, 2016, disappeared from Bear Camp in Oregon. Sean had gone to the same spot for 20 plus years. Nobody believed he got lost. If he didn't get lost, where'd he go? Zaid Dada, 31 years old, disappeared from Mount Nyangani National Park in Zimbabwe, 2015. He's never been found. Steve Thomas, 19, 1976, Mount Marcy in New York, told his group, I'm just gonna walk away for a little bit. I'll be back in just a bit. Never came back, never was found. Lieutenant Ernest Cody, Ensign Charles Adams, 1942, San Francisco, flying a blimp, flew out over the ocean. It crashed back on land. Both guys are gone, never found. Where are they? Is this all just seeming normal to you? Is this all within the rational behavior of people? Because that's what the Wikipedia page implies. B.B. Bukowski, 30 years old, disappeared from Crater Lake in 1911. Alfred Getz, 68 years old, 1939, disappeared, Crater Lake. Bukowski was a photographer, Getz was a mill worker, and Sammy Belke, Missing 411, the movie, that you can watch for free on YouTube movies, disappeared in 2006, eight years old, Crater Lake has never been found. Canines couldn't track him, never found. Katil Ulvang, 32 years old, 1993, from Norway, knew that area that he went for a run home in, like you and I know his backyards, is found in the water, deceased. Frederick Valenich, 20 years old, a pilot, disappeared in 1978 in Australia, described something unusual, unidentified, flying over him, around him, lost contact, his plane was never found, wreckage never found, no oil slick, no gasoline slick, nothing. David Prudeau, 50 years old, from Australia. He was a hunter in an area that he had hunted many times before in 2011, never found. Sylvia Apps, 69 years old, Vancouver Island, 2014. They found pieces of her clothing. They found pieces of her equipment strewn over a ridge. They thought for sure they were gonna find her, never been found. These are all videos that I've done. 
Daming Zhu, he's a professor of mathematics from Oregon, described as brilliant, 63 years old, disappeared in 2007 near Cougar Reservoir in Oregon, never found. Karen Sykes, 70 years old, Mount Rainier, had written trail books about Mount Rainier, knew that mountain like you know your backyard. She disappeared with a friend at point of separation, has found a ridge line over in deep snow, never, no explanation ever given about how she got there or why she would ever go there knowing that that is not the way back. Tom Messick in our movie, Missing 411, The Hunted for free on YouTube movies, disappeared. Messick was 82 years old in 2015, hunted his entire life. He was right around other people, disappeared, nothing ever found. He wasn't really mobile. How could he go that far and walk outside the bounds of the searchers? Alvy Webb, 87 years old, 2019, Colorado. His relatives put him down in a spot, said, hey, we'll be back in a couple hours. We'll push the animals towards you. They came back. Webb wasn't there. They never found anything of his, disappeared. And he was very immobile at 87. They couldn't understand where he would go. Satwant Baines, 54 years old, a truck driver, disappeared in Central California leaves his truck running on the side of the road. He's found in a canal two miles away. How do you get in the canal? Why would he go in a canal? Why would he go near the canal? Why would he climb a fence to get near the canal? Chance Engelbart, 25 years old, 2019, disappeared in Nebraska. Had an argument with some friends, his relatives, takes off, goes for a walk. There's a violent thunderstorm over the city. He disappears. Chance has never been found. Where'd he go? David Miller, a U.S. Forest Service Ranger, 25 years old, disappears in Arizona in 98, never found, backpack, nothing. He just vanished. Rachel Bagnall, 25 years old, 2010, and Jonathan Jett, 34 years old, also in 2010, from both hiked together in BC. She was pre-med, he was a government attache, vanished, never found. Two people together, almost never, never happens, never found. George Pinka Jr., 30 years old, 2011, Yosemite, with a church group walking up to Yosemite Falls. As they're coming back down, he's last in line, he's never seen again. Where'd he go? It's a paved trail. You can't get lost. If George had fallen in between some rocks off the trail, I guarantee folks, within a couple days, she used the expression, he'd be getting ripe, and people would smell him for miles. But he's never found. No odors, no nothing. Jelani Brinson, 24 years old, 2009, disappears from Anoka, Minnesota, at a gathering with friends. He disappears during a rainstorm. Search, and in the backyards of adjacent uh, homes, they find his socks, they found his shirt, they found some other things. Days later, his body surfaces in the pond at a golf course nearby. And the detectives, being smart, hmm, I'm sorry, they found his shoes at, in, in the backyard. So when his body surfaces, the detectives look, and his socks are absolutely pristinely clean. But he would have had to have walked through the mud to get to the pond. Smart detectives. They realized something's not right here. How did he get there? How did he drop personal items all the way to that point? Except there was a gap between the homes and the golf course. Never could determine the cause of death with Jelani. Carol Turner, 32 years old, 1971, Oregon Pipes Cactus National Monument. This is a case nobody ever heard of before until I found it, and nobody ever talked about it. She left a note on her car saying, if I'm not back by a certain time, please come look for me. I'm up this valley, and they did. And in the Forest Service reports and in the uh, search and rescue reports, they said that they had a very uncomfortable feeling going up that valley. You never see that in reports, ever. Hardly ever, ever, ever. What happened to her? She was never found it. She was super smart. She was in graduate school. 
Ida Mae Curtis, two years old, 1955, Kootenai National Forest, right near Libby, Montana. Her dad was a lumberman. And during 4th of July, they had uh, the campsite surrounded with tents so the family could visit him. Sometime during the middle of the day, someone saw something come into the tent, grab Ida Mae, and run off with her. A lot of people described it as a bear. She's found a couple days later in a pine burrow, a cedar burrow rather, and she told them that a bear kept her warm. Folks, I'm telling you, bears don't do that. Nope. And if Ida Mae would have been grabbed by a bear, the bear would have grabbed her with the mouth and she would have been seriously injured. So what happened to Ida Mae? What was she carried by? What kept her warm during the night? Was it a bear? Noah Donahoe, 14 years old, disappears 20, 2020 in Ireland. This is one of the cases that is completely baffling to me. I still don't get it. Stripped naked, young boy, brilliant young man, had a great future and disappears and is found in a sewer drain. Yes, found naked in a sewer drain. What? Doesn't make any sense. That list I just gave you is some of the most perplexing cases I've ever heard. Now, the people on Wikipedia say, oh yeah, these are just normal cases. Normal results, nothing unusual. It's what they said. <laughs> are they insane? Am I insane for saying it? How can these people get away with saying that stuff? But yet, every once in a while, probably once every two weeks, somebody will say, yeah, you know, I saw your post on Wikipedia. I'd rather not uh, do business with you. I'd rather not. This happens a lot. People look at Wikipedia and believe it. I've told you before that the founder of Wikipedia has said, do not believe anything on his site because everything's political. That's what he said. And uh, I've had some of the biggest people that I know of in the Wikipedia world try to get my profile changed. Because if you look at it, the, some analyst guy has more space on Wikipedia disproving me than I do on my own Wikipedia site. It's a joke. A couple of things they said in there are a thousand percent a lie. First of all, I was never ever asked to leave my police department. Lie. I don't know what to say about it other than it's super frustrating that that crap continues to be there and nobody can get it changed. Now, one more thing to add to all this. This right here is in Missing 411 Off the Grid. And what it is, is it's a list of individuals' names, the dates, their age, and how far they were found from the point they were last seen. In search and rescue books, it'll tell search and rescue that like if a two to three year old goes missing and they're on flat ground they'll be found 95 percent of the time two to three miles from the point they were last seen 95 percent of the time two to three miles okay so that means if they're outside of that that's pretty unusual but you see the people that wrote my wikipedia page they don't want to acknowledge that so how about a two-year-old disappeared in Florida in 1973? I wrote about it in Missing 411 North America with citations about where I got all the info. So a two-year-old's found 20 miles away. How about a two-year-old in Australia in 1936 is found 15 miles away in three days. These are areas with no roads, so nobody picked them up and drove them. And then you really go to the top of the list and you say a four-year-old in Wisconsin was found 30 miles away in three days. Could a three-year-old walk 30 miles in three days? I don't think so. But according to Wikipedia page, eh, that's normal. It's understandable. How about New Mexico, 1938, a four-year-old, I wrote this in Devils in the Detail, 40 miles away in four days. And the best one, in my humble opinion, is probably, hmm, Five-year-old in Australia, 1939, 34 miles in less than 36 hours. 
See, people know, especially law enforcement and searchers, that when it's dark, young kids lay down and go to sleep. And they'll sleep as long as they can because they don't like walking around in the dark because most little kids are afraid of the dark. And they'll wake up and they might walk a bit, but they're also used to taking naps. They're not like you and me that can go all day. Young child missing three days without water, there's a good chance that they may become deceased. A normal person can go three days, maybe four days without water, and then you're going to drop. You can go weeks if you're an adult without eating, but no, you can't go that long without food. Okay, so this missing 411 off the grid had this table in it that talked about miles, and it's two pages long of lists. And it goes from uh, a two-year-old, a two-and-a-half-year-old found eight miles away in 1916, all the way up to an 11-year-old who was found 100 miles away. Pretty unusual, in my humble opinion. But then again, Wikipedia doesn't think so. How about this? This is another table that's from the book. And this talks about elevation gained by victims, meaning that a victim disappears at, let's say, sea level, and then they're two and a half years old, and they're found 650 feet higher up a mountain than where they disappear. Believable? Hmm. Are kids notoriously lazy or are they going to climb uphill? How about a three-year-old in Arizona that's found 1,350 feet higher up the mountain than where they were found, than where they went missing? How about in Canada, a two-year-old found 1,800 feet higher? How about in 1957 in California, missing 411 Western U.S., I wrote about a two-year-old that body was found 3,000 feet higher into the mountains than where they disappeared. And then a four-year-old in Virginia, in North America and beyond, 3,372 feet higher in elevation than where they disappeared. So I don't care if it's an anomaly or people want to think, hmm, something unusual happened. It's not normal. And those are the examples that I wrote about in the books to catch people's attention because they aren't normal. I don't care what Wikipedia is trying to feed the public and the gullibility factor. I've had trained police officers after 30 years working a mountain district come to me and say, Dave, wow, those are weird cases. Never heard of a kid being able to do that before. Never would have set the grid pattern out that far. Yeah, exactly. So, remember in Missing 411, our first movie, we chronicled a young boy in, in Oregon that disappeared one night. We put Les Stroud at the location where the boy disappeared and said, try to follow his track to where he was eventually found the next morning, nine miles away in 12 hours, two-year-old, over fences, over through brooks, and he stopped in the middle of the night and said, Dave, crew, we got to stop. Because he'd never walked that route before, just like the boy never walked that route. And he said, we we'll end up getting ourselves seriously hurt. We'll walk off a cliff. We'll slip in the stream. We'll break our neck. No, we can't go any further. This is too dangerous. And let's make it clear. This little boy didn't do that either. So what happened? And we put those cases in the movies and in the books because the parents out there that have children know oh, their kid would never do that. And it's more easily digested and understood of the unusual nature because it is a young child. If I wrote about a man that was found nine miles away in 12 hours, Nobody would give it two blinks. But when we talk about young kids, you should be paying attention. So, this segment right here, mark it down, take some notes, say, okay, this is what I'm going to give to somebody to look at because I really want them to, to grasp it. If it's a family that has young kids, 
have them watch Missing 411, our first movie, on YouTube Movies, because all it is is about kids. Missing 411 The Hunted, it's about a different set of circumstances. We went a little different direction. Now, in our first movie, there's a case regarding a young boy named Dior Kuntz, who, as the parents said, they turned their back and the boy just disappeared. And a lot of people didn't like the way the parents acted on, on video. I understand. But you also, if you read the books, you'd have a different understanding about the possibilities related to that case. Because dozens of times I had parents say, I just turned around and the boy was gone. Kids can't disappear that quick. And when they bring in professional trackers, they bring in search and rescue dogs, can't pick up a scent, don't find any tracks. In the Dior Coons case, Dior's never been found, no one's ever been arrested, and as of just recently, I talked to the sheriff of that county, sorry, uh, Sheriff Penner, and he said that they have no new developments on the case. So, I'm not saying that it's not a criminal case. I'm, I am saying, though, facts stand in my book. It's unusual. And I'm not going to draw any conclusions other than that. So don't get frustrated. Uh, please, if you have a book and it's just carrying space on your bookcase, think about donating it to a library. There's a lot of people out there who want to read it and libraries need more books. And if you're thinking about buying a book from me, I'm very grateful. Don't buy it on Amazon. Don't buy it anywhere online from our website. The link's on this page on the video. Again, we do we don't sell on Amazon. These are resellers trying to rip you off. So the movies are free, the videos are free, and the books support us. In my years of doing this, over 10 years, I've never asked for donations. I, I don't believe in handouts. I believe you get something for what you purchase. And I've never had anybody throw the book back at me and say, oh, this is garbage. And if you look at the reviews of our movies online, and if you look at the reviews of our books online, you'll see that they're very good. Everybody goes to Amazon to read those reviews. My second request. If you've watched the movies or you've read the books, please go to Amazon and leave a review. Why? Because every review helps really does. People go there, they read a current review, a recent review, and they think, oh, okay, this is, this is good, or this is whatever, and they'll make a decision about it. So you, the village, that's one thing you can do to help me. It won't cost you anything, and it would help us a lot. So, and again, I've had people watch our movies five, six, seven times, because each time they say that they glean something different about it. So don't be bashful about doing that either. I mean, it's free right now. I don't know how long it'll be up there, but so far YouTube is keeping it up. If you don't want to go to YouTube, you can also watch it on Amazon for like a buck, buck and a half and download it. And it could be yours. So this episode has been a little different. We have talked about missing people. We have talked about the psychology behind it, suicides in national parks, key cases, really important, key cases. Those are the ones I gave you that I've done videos about or they are in our movies. So you can watch them right now for free and uh, write their names down, refer them to people, let them do their own research. <laughs> Somebody the other day made a comment on one of my YouTubes. Hey, I, I looked all over for those, those citations that Dave gave and I can't find them. So what's the implication? You're not a good researcher or that I'm lying? Trust me, folks, I'm not lying to you about this. If 
I give you a citation on a case, or I give you facts behind the case, I'm not so stupid as to lie about them. Because then I'd really be losing my credibility. And friends, I've got enough cases that are strange enough, I don't need to lie about cases. Uh, you people out there that have read the series, or have read a lot of the books, your comments about the books are always appreciated. And again, I know, and I, I hear this from you guys all the time, that you get a lot more detail out of reading the books than you can out of the videos, and I get that. In the movies, we only have so much time to detail each case, and we try to do the best job we can in getting the most cases in without being superfluous in the movie, which is a touchy, touchy thing. So I'm at the end of my time. Uh, I hope. I hope our village can continue to grow and you continue to spread the good word. And if you could make this a priority, if you know people that are gonna go hunting as hunting season's coming up, tell them to get their hunter, a personal locator beacon, and tell them to uh, carry it. Some people I heard the other day saying, oh yeah, my husband, he's much too manly to admit he needs that. Friends, I wrote a book that's that thick on hunters that were missing. And I guarantee one thing, there's one hunter in that book that ever thought they'd need one. And there were hundreds of people in that book that, that are on the verge of death. If they had known a personal locator beacon, have known about them, I bet they wish they had one. Think about that. Thank you so much for being here. I will... Hopefully be back soon, if YouTube allows me. And uh, I thank you for the friendship. I'm indebted. Let's keep this thing growing. God bless America. Two flags will mean a lot to me, and I hope they I hope they mean a lot to you.